Hello everyone, welcome to the Green Man channel, hope you're all good and well and ready for another Saturday premiere on the channel and this time of course I'm going back to the Malazan Book of the Fallen series for its seventh book this is of course the epic fantasy series by Stephen Erickson and uh, previously on the channel I did a book review for Bone Hunters feel free if you're new to the channel and just getting to know Malazan or it's the first time maybe you've heard of it to check out my other book reviews just remembering that usually I do the first part of the video as a spoiler free book review discussing my general thoughts and maybe setting the scene for the book a bit um, and then the second part is usually there are some major spoilers in the story um, so I tend to suggest if you don't really know the books that you avoid at all costs the second part of these videos where I go much more into my kind of favourite moments, favourite quotes and scenes from the book. Um, so anyway, so this book is Reaper's Gale and it is nicely in terms of the Malazan timeline following on from the Bone Hunters. Um, but I've got to say this was a really, this was a tricky book for me to get through. I found this one a bit of a struggle and I think that's for a few different reasons. And um, it may be that this book is introducing yet more characters, um, another race into, into, the, into things. It's introducing, it's expanding and building this world even more so than has already been done, been done to this point. If you think this is the seventh book in this series by Stephen Erickson and he's still expanding, he's still... Um, adding more details, adding more characters, then you kind of get a sense that this is really the most epic of epic fantasy series and you have to be patient with it and once again, seventh time round, I think you have to be particularly patient with this book because it's a very dense and detailed book. Erickson's habit of quite frenetic writing really does seem, uh, you know, in individual chapters in this book you are jumping a lot from different groups of characters and sometimes it can be hard to keep track of all the different plot threads. I've tried my best with this. I think even now, I'm not sure I've quite got every single plot thread, um, you know, nailed, uh, understood. I think it's just a sign of just, you know, that it's, this is a book you have, have to be really quite patient with. But saying that, I do like the way this book bridges the gap between Midnight Tides and Bone Hunters. I really like the way it does that. And actually, there, it once again, is a lot of really fabulous character work in this book. He's done a great job with the characters and including the new ones I think that he introduces he does a pretty good job with those as well and enticing you into those stories so despite some of the convoluted and the, the tricky to read that the writing style that, that I sometimes find with Ericsson despite all those things it's still a good book it's still probably a four out of five star book for me I, I still am pretty impressed by it generally so just to set the scene a, a bit more for this one this entry in the series um, so we're going back a bit more for me uh, to the characters of Midnight Tide, certainly focusing in a bit on the Lefairy Empire, but he introduces a few new aspects of the Empire, like this police force, this patriotist force, um, who are tasked with policing the Empire, and you have a couple of really unpleasant characters that you get to know as part of the patriotists, I think in particular is Tanal Yathanar, um, and you also have the um, this Liberty consign of merchants that are run by this Rautos Ivanar character too. Uh, you're also introduced to actually Prevar Bilat and her attempts to try and sort of wipe out this race called the Oldan, who you're introduced to in this book as well. And this character called Red Mask, who I think is quite a cool character, although I did find myself kind of questioning his, his purpose at times in this book, I guess, but maybe that will be explained later in another book or something. Don't want to go too deep into that uh, without so not give away any spoilers, of course. Um, of course you've got this uh, group really that get called the Hunted uh, who are sort of these, they're, they're the sort of fugitive characters uh, from the, the Bone Hunters book, I guess you've got Fear, Sengar, with Silchas Ruin, Seren Padak, Udinas, uh, Kettle and Wither uh, who are kind of on the run from um, the rule of Rulads if you like here altogether and uh, makes for some interesting developments with that part of the story in particular I think. Um, you also have the Malazan, the Bone Hunters from the previous book too, getting involved in things, Tavor, the Adrak Tavor commanding them, uh, with Lostara Yul now as her second in command, interestingly. And uh, they're trying to seek to free the fairy from the apparent Tista dual rule. And uh, developments relating to that also get pretty uh, interesting in this book too. And you've got Cars all along again coming into things with Ikarium. Uh, and Samar Dev and her relationship with these characters is very, very interesting, particularly with Cars. So I like the ongoing way that that relationship is developed once again in this book, even more so. And I think it's fascinating. Um, 
so yeah, lots of high points in this book, despite its length, despite I think it's it, the, the the nature of the way this book is or the way this book is written, it's still um, it still adds something I think to this story, still keeps you involved generally. I, I did find it a challenge because of the writing style, I will emphasize that. Um, but but yeah, um, another good entry in the series, this one. Um, so let's move on to my favorite moments. The best moments that I felt were in Reaper's Gale. So, spoiler alert, turn off now if you don't want to know any kind of pretty major spoilers from this book. So, let's start with the first one. Uh, Feather Witch and Hannah Mosak have a very interesting exchange quite early on in this book, oh, it's 200, page 262. And um, you know, she's arguing really with Hassan Hannah Mosak about how the empire, the Lefairy Empire would have looked had it been ruled over by him. And he, she says, so you keep saying she cut him with a sneer. And how would the great empire of Hannah Mosak have looked? A rain of flowers onto every street, every citizen freed of debt, with the benignities to do it, overseeing it all. She leaned forwards towards him, I think, here. And you forget I was born among your people in your very tribe, Warlock King. I remember going hungry during the Unification Wars. I remember the cruelty you heaped upon us slaves. When we got too old, you used us as bait for Beskra crabs. And, uh, you know, she's really going at him now, there and really sort of, um, I think, giving him some of what maybe he deserves there. Um, and then next up, another favourite moment, is actually Prada uh, resigning herself to a defeat against Redmaster. Kind of this whole cat and mouse battle thing going on throughout parts of this book between actually Prada and Bivat and Red Mask. I like the way she admits to kind of defeat in this in this particular scene where she says I'm outwitted, flinching on every side, recording, reacting, Red Mask, this one is yours. And um, yeah, but then she goes on to say, but I'll have you in the end, I swear it. So that's my second favourite moment of this book. Third favourite moment is moving on to Shirk and Lau where she's questioning the adjunct's mission here to so apparently free the Lefairy from the Tiskadur rule. And uh, it's interesting because the way that Shokalal sees it is that, yeah, the Tista do are yeah, kind of, uh, you know, kind of in charge, but the but theory is still more or less running things, a lot of the, you know, things like the patriotists, I guess, here and, and stuff like that. And uh, that it's, it's, it's more that, you know, the Tista do aren't really, they don't really govern um, as such. So she's kind of questioning what exactly the purpose of the Malazan army here is, you know, what, what is its what is its ultimate goal? Because it may just make things even worse than they are. So um, this is where the adjunct says, uh, our enemy, the adjunct said, all amusement now gone, are the Tista Dior captain, not the Lefairy. In fact, we would encourage a general uprising of the Lefairy, you know, against the Tista Dior, that's what she's saying. But Shokalal said, you won't get it. And Lostara, your replies goes, why not? And then Shokalal responds, because we happen to like things the way they are, more or less. And when no one spoke, she smiled and continued. The Adua may well have usurped their rulers in their absurd half-finished palace in Etheraz, and they may well have, well have savaged the few of the fairy armies on the way to the capital. But you will not find bands of starving rebels in the forest dreaming of independence. So it's kind of like, you know, there she's saying, do, 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 do they really need to be freed as such? Uh, is, is it going to make things any better? Uh, you know, and it's sort of an interesting perspective on things. And I think sheds a bit of a light on the politics of the Malazan series as well. And in a way, uh, you might say you wonder where Ericsson drew some inspiration from. Maybe some of the current political events, maybe sort of happening around the time of, of this book was, was an influence maybe or other historical events in, in, in history that were sort of influencing his writing of, of um, you know, conquest and the consequence on, on politics and all that, all that sort of thing. Next up we have, um, as my fourth favourite moment now, moving on to, I think, we've got Rulad. Uh, he actually sends his parents um, to these dungeon crypts, these really awful dungeon crypts. Um, he has been really manipulated to this point in the story, I think, and he's obviously, you know, he's, he's unhinged. He, he's going completely, you know, completely mad here. Um, and, yeah, decides, you know, uh, he's going to send his parents to, to this dungeon. And he says, you will both spend two months interred in the dungeon crypts of the fifth wing. You will live in darkness, fed once a day through shoots in the ceilings of your cells. Um, you will have no one but each other with whom to speak. You will be shackled in darkness. Do you understand? Uh, really, uh, really quite unpleasant there. And, uh, you know, <laughs> 
what can you do? What can you do? For, in a way, I feel sorry. I do feel sorry for Rulads and everything he's going gone through, and and that he's just so you know, so just completely ruled over really by his this this chance. The guy's completely uh, manipulating, and and um, it's yeah, it's 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 not nice what's happened to Rulads. The whole the whole kind of Rulads tragedy is 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 brought to the fore again. Now my last favourite moment, favourite number number five, start again. Favourite moment number five is the Kachan Shamal when they actually turn on Red Mask. I mean, this is an amazing moment, I think, in the book, and it gets quite gory as well. Um, so, Sagatarok, I think, is, is when his sword lashes out. So, I'm going to read the passage here where Red Mask is basically taken out. Right, so the sword lashed out in a blur, taking the horse from the front at the neck just above its collarbones. A blow of such savagery and strength that it tore entirely through, cracking hard against the wooden rim of the high saddle. Knocking Red Mask back over the beast's rump, even as the headless horse ran on another half dozen strides before wavering to one side, then collapsing. He struck the muddy ground on one shoulder, skidded, then rolled to a halt, and hung to his feet, straightening even as Sagturok slashed its second blade, taking him above the knees. Blood fountained as he toppled onto his back, and found himself staring at his severed legs still standing upright in the mud. Uh, can you imagine that? I mean, what a way to go. Not not very uh, not a great way to go. And Red Mask as well. I mean, he seems to have just been kind of introduced for this particular book almost. And I did find myself at times questioning what, what his ultimate goal or purpose was being being as part of this story. And I do wonder whether that be revealed. Guys, but there were some great scenes with with uh, involving him in this book. That being one of them, I think. And uh, yeah, one of my favourite moments, which sure that's the last favourite moment I'm going to name. So do let me know in the comments, what were your favourite moments of Reaper's Gale? How do you think it stacks up against the other books? Do you actually think, you know, maybe it's your favourite in the series? It probably isn't my favourite in the series. I'd say still my favourites are probably Dead House Gates and The Bone Hunters, actually the last book I read before this one. But I'm really looking forward to The Toll of Hounds, I think it is the next book in the series. I've heard really good things about that one, so... Until that episode, uh, if you're following the Malazan book reviews on the channel, I will probably join you there for that. Otherwise, next up, the next premiere, going back to the music side of the channel for the next Saturday premiere next time, we have my top 10 new metal albums of all time. Yes, we are going to new metal. We are going cringe for new metal. So until then, take care, everybody. Bye for now.